morning. Today I'm going to talk to you about the complications of instrumentation in pediatric syndromic craniovertebral junction anomalies. Way back, Joseph Maroon, one of the famous neurosurgeons from Pittsburgh, in his presidential address to CNS said that complications of God's way of keeping surgeons humble. I have had my share of uh, humbling occasions and some of those humbling occasions is what I am going to share with you today. Case number one is a 10 year old boy who came to us with torticollis and spastic quadriparesis who on imaging was found to have significant compression at the craniovertebral junction with intramolary signal changes. He was a case of pro segmentation anomaly with bacillary imagination and atlantic axial dislocation. And in addition, his coronal CD showed a hypoplastic occipital condyle and absence on lateral mass on one side, both of which were responsible for his uh, torticollis. So I would like you to look at the left and right side facet joints. The dist distance between the um, joint surface is something which I missed, the importance of which until I got into problem intraoperatively. Now, plan for this particular patient was to do the anterior retropharyngeal approach, which so elegantly Sushil Padkar described just now. So, plan was to do an intraoperative traction, reduce the BI, put a spacer in the uh, AA joint, and then put the plates and screws as Sushil Padkar had described. Everything went, went on well until I placed the spacer. These are the trial spacers, but once they put the uh, spacer, the largest available spacer just fit on the one side, on the other side it was not snugly fitting, but I thought once I release the traction it will fit. But what happened is when I released the spacer, the spacer went behind the joint. And this is the AP view which shows for 30 to 40 minutes after 30, 40 shots of CR, we struggled to get the spacer back. Eventually we gave up and did a post-op CT which showed the spacer lying just behind the joint. So he had no choice but to go in posteriorly the very next day and there lies the spacer. So we ended up doing an uh, occipital cervical fusion reinforced with a rib graft. And these are the pre and post-op patient of course improved well and uh, the pa patient was discharged in a walking condition. Now what made us commit this mistake? Preconceived notions. As someone famous said, preconceived notions are the locks on the door to wisdom. And we are so much we are like a horse with blinkers. Nowadays we are so much used to using all these big spacers, uh, titanium spacers, we have forgotten what is the original good bone, autologous iliac crest bone. In this particular case, because the biggest spacer was not fitting in properly, all that was required was to remove the spacer and replace it with a good chunk of cortical bone. That would have served our purpose and it would have prevented the second surgery from happening. This is a lesson which I learned from this particular case. Now let's go to case number two. This is a much more simpler complication, generally encountered in about 5% of the CV junction cases. This, this was also a case of pro segmentation anomaly, a young boy who came to us with spastic quadriversis following a trivial fall, who on imaging was found to have an AAD, and uh, there was significant compression at the cervicomolar junction, and CT showed what is sometimes referred to an os service or a dystopic os odontoidium, and this particular patient underwent a classical Goalham's fusion. And, uh, the post-op x-ray looks good, the sagittal images looks good, I can stop with that, but then when you do an axial CT, this is what is seen. This is what is known as a grade 2 violation of the screw. If 50% of the screw is in the transverse foramen or in the canal, it is known as a grade 2 violation. We are just going to present uh, our results next month where we have found that 4% of our C1 screws are, are in grade 2 misplaced. And why does this happen? The literature does not tell you how to prevent this except for one article from Korea which I, pub I read in Spine Journal which says that when you drill or tap the lateral mass it is important for your assistant to give a counter pressure because the basic movement at the C1C2 joint is rotation. If we don't give a counter pressure the lateral mass will move and your screw will get misdirected. This simple technique can prevent misdirection of the C1 lateral mass screw. Now let's go to the next condition, a less common condition, Marcos, 
because I am interested in pediatric cervical spine, I do some of this stuff and I have learned some lessons from Marcios. This first case was a 12 year old male who came to me with spastic quadriceps with all the classical features of Marcos Brailleford disease and he had a um, odontoid hypoplasia, atlantic axial dislocation, platy spondylia, bullet vertebrae and all that stuff. And in addition you notice there is a bifid anterior and posterior arch of atlas. And we did a plan to do a classical goal harms. You see the bifid posterior arch of atlas. He, the surgery went on well. In fact the patient also did extremely well. These are the post-op images a few months later which shows the implants in situ. But then post-operatively I realized, and this patient did well, I followed this patient for more than two years. Post-operatively within a week I realized I should have done something else. Because this patient has got a bipartite atlas, I should have put a cross connector between the two. But then patient's parents were not willing for a rego because the patient by then had improved. And then two years later Adil Goyal came up with this publication suggesting that he had operated on 70 patients with combined bifid anterior and posterior arch and uh, he had good results like we did. But then at the end he mentioned that it would have been prudent to put a cross connector between the two sides. So when the next case came, a 6 years old female once again with Marcus Brailsworth's disease with spastic quadruples, she was bedridden, she had an atlantic axial dislocation and um, she had all the classical features of Marcus she also had a bipartite atlas. So she had a significant compression with intramural signal changes at the cranial junction. This time I had become a little wiser. So that's the bifid posterior arch. So this time I, what I did was I put a transarticular C1 C2 screw and then connected using a horizontal connector. So this patient improved significantly and uh, these are the post-op images. And uh, two months later a bedridden patient was able to stand with support and six months later she was uh, ambulant independently. So I patted myself on the back, felt proud that I al already solved the problem of uh, bipartite atlas with AAD. But then I uh, forgot whatever elders have taught us, pride goes before the fall. And to teach me that lesson came this patient, this six years old male with another case of Marcos, a very difficult case. Notice that practically there is no neck, the head is sitting on the chest and the ch child has a kyphotic deformity, there's a pectus carinatum. These children have a lot of anesthetic and positioning complications which I can talk about for another half an hour. And these are the radiological classical features of Marcus braille folds. And this particular patient also had a combined bifid anterior and posterior arch. And she, uh, she also had a odontoid hypoplasia. And notice the 3D CT, the importance of this 3D CT, the importance especially of the C2 posterior, C2 posterior elements, which I realized intraoperatively only. Now, this patient also had significant uh, kyphosis at the cervicothoracic and thoracolumbar junction. This patient should be followed up lifelong because these are two other sites where compression can occur later. Now, this patient was operated with intraoperative monitoring. And I had three options in this particular patient. Option A was to do a transarticular as I did in the previous case, which I thought will be difficult because of the short neck. Option two was to do a C1, C2 with the uh, trans uh, cross connecting rod. Option three was to do an occipital C3, C4. There are so three options. Intraoperately, all the three options failed. Now, I could not do a C transarticular because I could not get the necessary angle. There is profuse bleeding from the C2 venous plexus. Being a child, I could not afford to lose more blood. And as I tightened the subaxial lateral mass screws, the screws pulled out. So eventually I ended up doing a occiput C2 pass screw on one side and C2 trans lamina screw on the other side. And uh, that is where the, uh, the, C, the CT which I showed became important. And these are the images. You look at the post-op images, the C2 pass screw and the C2 trans lamina screw. And this patient, of course, did well. Now, what I could have done better in this particular case, retrospectively thinking back, I realized I could have put a hook on C1 and the C2 pass and C2 trans lamina screw on both sides. And I could, could have done a cross connector, thereby preserving the, the occipital cervical motion. There are many other techniques to do a C1-C2 fusion described in the literature uh, with when there's a bifid posterior arch. Now, f f the final part of the lecture is what happens to the fused spine when the spine is skeletally immature? Now, the crankshaft phenomenon, most people believe 
the it happens only in idiopathic scoliosis not so it has been shown that crankshaft phenomenon does occur when you fuse a growing spine especially the upper cervical spine even though the pediatric, pediatric craniotable junction society of north america does not believe so there is ample evidence in the literature that this publication from japan clearly shows that there is a uh, the, the growing spine does get affected when you fuse the spine and an excellent publication from um, uh, Bellow has shown that nearly 55% of children who undergo occipital cervical fusion develop exaggerated lordosis removing the uh, necessitating the removal of the implant. So finally, in children, once biological fusion is achieved, can the instrumentation be removed? That is something which you have to think about. And finally, to conclude, Good surgical judgment comes from experience, but experience comes from bad surgical judgment. Thank you.